that I, I just couldn't. Um, and then I realized something else. I realized that I didn't know any other authors in the entire world who had read these books and loved these books as much as I had. There are people out there that are better writers than me. There are people out there who are bigger fans than me. Um, but there is nobody who has both. And I realized that as a writer and as a person who loved the series, the very next best thing to having Robert Jordan write it himself was to write it and not screw it up. Um, because I knew that of all the people in the world, at least in that case, it would be in the hands of somebody who loved the series, who knew the characters like their best friends. And I thought of other works that this had been done with, and some turned out okay, some turned out terrible, and I realized that if I said no to this, and it went into the hands of someone who was just looking for a paycheck, and it didn't turn out right, that it would be partially my fault. Um, in essence, I realized that of all the people in the world, I would screw this book up the least. <laughs> Does that make any sense? Yeah. Um, I mean, it was, it was the realization that as a fan of someone who actually loved the series, I had to say yes. Even though there was no way I could write as good a book as he could write, I had to say yes, because then I would know that somebody who cared about it was doing it. Um, and that was the real reason I wrote her that email the next day. I did start off with the line I just told you. I, I, I phrased it a little less um, stupidly. Um, but I then went into it and I said, Harriet, I, I've realized something. Um, I've realized that I do want to do this. And if, if Robert Jordan can't be here to write this book, then I need to do it. Um, because I promise you that I will give it the reverence it deserves and I will bring this book to the readers, and it won't be about me, it will be about Robert Jordan. It will actually be about the characters. In fact, when Robert Jordan wrote it, it wasn't about Robert Jordan. It was about the people in these books. And I knew that I could bring a book that would be about the people. I wasn't sure at that time how would it even work. It was a very daunting task to even consider, but I knew that at least I would care. Um, and that's why I sent her that email. And um, she sent me a very nice reply. And then I waited for a month. Uh, during this time, uh, Harriet read my book, Mist Born, uh, the first of my trilogy. Uh, she actually um, says that she got about 40 pages in, and that's when she knew. Um, she, did, she, that's when she knew that she wanted me. And then she called me sometime in November, and she said, Brandon, I would like you to do this. And that's how I'm here. That's why me. Um, that's the whole completeness of the story. Uh, how she found me in the first place had to do with that blog post that I posted because uh, a friend of hers printed it off and gave it to her. So I'm very glad that I did that. Um, <laughs> it was a combination of that and Miss Bourne and, and me really, really wanting it after it was offered to me. Um, and so. Now you have the book. It is one third of the outline that was left behind. I'm going to get you the other two thirds as soon as possible. Um, and we will go ahead and have Harriet do her reading now. And I wasn't delaying. I wasn't delaying to make him sweat. It was, it was to be sure that I could find the very best possible writer in the world to complete the series because I loved my husband very much and I knew him very well and I knew that he wouldn't hesitate to come back and get me <laughs> if I did a bad job. So I'm very grateful to Brandon for what he has done and for undertaking this enormous task in the first place. Who's read The Gathering Storm? Oh my God, everybody in Dallas caught, caught in sick. <laughs> okay, this is, a, this is a piece from the prologue for the two or three of you who haven't read it yet. It's a tiny spoiler, but it's from page 44, so it doesn't spoil much. The prophet's fingers bit dirt tearing trenches in the soil as he scrambled up to the top of the forested hillside. His followers straggled behind, so few, 
so few, but he would rebuild. The glory of the dragon reborn followed him, and no matter where he went, he found willing souls, those with hearts that were pure, those who had hands that burned to destroy the shadow. Yes, think not of the past, think of the future, when the Lord Dragon would rule all of the land, when, when men would be subject only to him and to his prophet beneath him. Those days would be glorious indeed, days when none would dare scorn the prophet or deny his will. Days when the prophet wouldn't have to suffer the indignity of living near the very camp, the very one, as shadow spawn, like that creature, a bara. Glorious days, glorious days were coming. It was difficult to keep his thoughts on those future glories. The world around him was filthy. Man denied the dragon and sought the shadow, even his own followers. Yes, that must have been why they had fallen. That must have been why so many died when assaulting the city of Malden and its dark friend Aiel. The prophet had been so certain, he had assumed that the dragon would protect his people, lead them to a powerful victory. Then the prophet would finally have gotten his wish. He could have killed Paranebaro with his own hands, twist that too thick bull's neck in his fingers, twist it around, squeezing, <laughs> feeling. <laughs> feeling the bone. I can share the scene there too. <laughs> feeling the bones crack, the flesh ring, the breath stop. The prophet reached the top of the ridge and brushed the dirt from his fingers. He breathed in and out, scanning around him, underbrush rustling as his few remaining followers climbed up toward him. The canopy was dense overhead and very little sunlight peeked through. Light, radiant light, the dragon had appeared to him the night before the attack, appeared in glory, a figure of light glowing in the air in shimmering robes. Kill Paranebara, the dragon had commanded, kill him. And so the prophet had sent his very best tool, Abara's own dear friend. That boy, that tool had failed. Aram was dead. The prophet's men had confirmed it. Tragedy, was that why they had not prospered? Was that why out of his thousands of followers, he now had only a bare handful? No, no, they must have turned against him, secretly worshiping the shadow, Aram, dark friend. That was why he had failed. The first of his followers, battered, dirtied, bloodied, exhausted, reached the top of the ridge. They wore threadbare clothing that did not set them above others, the clothing of simplicity and goodness. The prophet counted them all, fewer than a hundred, so few, this cursed forest was so dark, despite the daylight. Thick trunks stood shoulder to shoulder, and the sky overhead had grown dim with cloud cover. The underbrush of thin-branched boneweed shrubs matted together, forming an almost unnatural barrier, and those shrubs scratched like claws on his skin. With that underbrush and the sharp earthen bank, the army could not follow this way. Though the prophet had escaped from Ibarra's camp barely an hour before, he already felt safe. They would go north, where Ibarra and his dark friends would not find them. There, the prophet could rebuild. He had stayed with Ibarra only because his followers had been strong enough to keep Ibarra's dark friends away. His dear followers, brave men and true, every one, killed by dark friends. He mourned them, bowing his head and muttering a prayer. His followers joined him. They were weary, but the light of zeal shone in their eyes. Any who were weak or who lacked dedication had fled or been killed long ago. These were the best, the mightiest, the most faithful. Each one had killed many dark friends in the name of the dragon reborn. With them he could rebuild, but first he had to escape a bower. The prophet was too weak now to face him, but later he would kill him. Yes, fingers on that neck, yes. The prophet could remember a time when he'd been called something else. Masema. Those days were going very blurry to him, like memories from a former life. Indeed, just as all men were reborn into the pattern, so had Masema been reborn. He had cast off his old profane life and had become the prophet. The last of his followers joined him atop the cliff face. He spat at their feet. They had failed him, cowards. They should have fought better. He should have been able to win that city. He turned north and pushed his way forward. The landscape was growing familiar. They would climb to the highlands, then cross over and enter Almar Plain, 